Hello, my friends. My name is Lucas Mann. <clears throat> I'm the pastor of the Spring Church in Lawrence, just a few miles down the road. And I come out here throughout the week, typically on Wednesdays and Tuesday, uh, uh, Mondays and Tuesdays and Fridays. And my friends, I come out here for one express purpose, to preach to you the gospel message of Jesus Christ, to tell you about salvation in Him alone. I'm out here to warn you about your sin, to warn you about the coming judgment, but to present to you the ark of salvation, which has been prepared before all the sight of all peoples, the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who can save you from your sins. And I testify to this not only because the Word of God says it, but because I myself have experienced what the Word of God says. My friends, there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name given under heaven among men by which we must be saved. We praise God for that. I come out here not only for your benefit, not only for your salvation, but to bring God glory. God is worthy for, uh, of honor and exaltation. He's worthy to be worshipped among the sons of men because of the great things He has done. In fact, the old hymn puts it well. It says, So come to the Father through Jesus Christ the Son and give Him the glory for the great things He has done. And dear friends, that's what I'm out here to do. I want to bring God glory through pro proclaiming salvation in Christ alone. I want to make much of sin, but to make much of the Savior who can save you from your sins. My friends, it is true that people are the enemies of God, but God is, is willing to reconcile you to Himself through the cross of Jesus Christ. That's why the Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5 that the word of the cross is the word of reconciliation. It's the ministry of reconciliation, friends. It's the only access that you can have to God is through Jesus Christ. And the passage of Scripture I would like to look at is in Romans chapter 1, beginning in verse 11. I'm going through Romans in the open air, so this is the next text that I've come upon. And so the Apostle Paul writes these words. He says, For I long to see you so that I may impart some spiritual gift to you, that you may be established, that is, that I may be encouraged together with you while among you, each of us by the other's faith, both yours and mine. I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that I have often planned to come to you and have been prevented so far, so that I may obtain some fruit among you also, even as among the rest of the Gentiles. I am under obligation both to, Jew, to both the great, uh, Gentiles and barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. So for my part, I am eager to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome. And my friends, in those same words, I say I'm eager to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ to you who are in Greenville, to you who are far and near, my friends, whoever's in the sound of my voice, to tell you about the love of the Savior, to warn you about God's judgment and God's wrath against sin, to warn you about your sins. Not only do they bring bad effect upon you in this life, but in the life to come. Eternal hellfire. My friends, don't be deceived. Hell is real. Hell, there's, there's conscious torment after death, my friends, if you're outside of Christ. The heaven's gates are only open wide through Jesus Christ, to, to those who come to God through Christ. So this passage of Scripture, the Apostle Paul is expressing his desire to preach the gospel to these Roman Christians, these, these uh, believers who were in Rome. And my friends, that is a, a, fitting, a fitting launch pad for me to say that the, the title of this would be the gospel for all. The gospel message is for all people. It doesn't matter where you're from. It, it doesn't matter what you make. It doesn't matter the color of your skin. It doesn't matter what place in society you have. The gospel is for you. The gospel is for you. This gospel is the gospel that can save everybody. It's effectual to save all. Sadly, though, all will not believe it, but many reject it. Many reject the word of the cross. The Apostle Paul said in, in, in 1, uh, 1 Corinthians 1.18, that the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. In other words, those on their way to hell. It's foolishness to them, dead in their sins. And that's why they need to be raised to spiritual life by the saving power of the Almighty God. The God who can save you from your sins. The true God of Scripture. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why he uses the language here when he says he's eager to make it to Rome. He's eager to see these Christians. He's eager to be with them. He's eager to, and he even says in, um, in verse 14, he says, I'm under obligation. Dear friends, I as well, as a believer in Jesus Christ, as someone who has been saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, I, have, I am under obligation to preach to you the gospel, to share with you this message of life. I mean, it is, it is the most precious truth 
that can ever be proclaimed, that ever will be proclaimed. The most glorious reality, the greatest of all news. In fact, the Greek word for the gospel is euangelion, and it means good tidings. And I always think of, when I hear that, I think of Christmas time. Everybody, they have that song, of good tidings for Christmas and a happy new year. And people talk about, that's an exciting season of the year. My friends, well, for a Christian, all the time it is exciting. All the time it is joyful. Because we always have the good news, the good tidings with us. That Jesus died for sin, that He was buried, and that He was raised on the third day according to what the Scriptures say. That Jesus is not merely uh, a prophet. He was not merely a teacher. He was not merely the Son of Man, but the Son of God, the divine God-man. Fully, truly God and fully, truly man. And my friends, this is, the good, this is the good news of the gospel. And I want to present that to you, and I will, even much more thoroughly as I just did. But I want to present it to you in front of the black drop of the bad news. The, the, the bad news of God's, of God's judgment against sin and God's wrath against the wicked. Because God hates the wicked. The Bible says that God has a, a hatred for the wicked. In fact, it says He's angry with them every day. But that anger can be taken away, can be taken off of them through the message of the gospel. And just to note quickly on our context, this is really the opening of Paul's, of Paul's epistle to the Romans. He's writing these opening statements. This is what his book is going to be about, an unfolding of the gospel message. That's why the book of Romans is so precious, because it's, it's just an exposition of what the gospel message is. In fact, in the next verse, in verse 16, he says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. That's his thesis statement for the book. That's his thesis statement. He's going to unfold that. He's going to unpack that. He's going to, he's going to expound upon that through the rest of the book. And I'll end up restating that multiple times to stress that point. That this is what the book is about. This is what all of Scripture is about, my friends. Not simply just this book of Romans. It's what the whole Bible's about. That Jesus died for sinners. That He satisfied, He placated the, the wrath of Almighty God. In fact, the Bible uses the word in Romans 3, propitiation. 1 John 2, it also uses that term, propitiation. It means wrath has been absorbed. Christ absorbed. God's wrath against sin. The infinite wrath that God has against sin was poured out on His Son instead of sinners, instead of the elect, instead of the church. And praise God that He did not die in defeat, but in victory. For He Himself rose from the grave on the third day and was exalted into heaven 40 days later as the great high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek, as Hebrews says, and he will never die again. Death has no reign or no power over him, for he is the life. In and of himself, he, by his own nature, is life. And so, my friends, there is great hope for you if you trust in him. If you have your hope in him, because Scripture says in Romans 10, 11, he who believes in him will not be disappointed. And so, as I said a moment ago when I announced the title, of this sermon, that it's the gospel for all. Let's look at that. Let's look at that, how it unfolds in these verses, beginning in verse 11. The gospel for all. He says, Paul says, For I long to see you that I may impart some spiritual gift to you, that you may be established. That is, that I may be encouraged together with you while among you, each of us by the other's faith, both yours and mine. I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that I have often planned to come to you, and have been prevented so far so that I may obtain some fruit among you also, even as among the rest of the Gentiles. So the Apostle Paul is wishing to come to these Christians, preach the gospel in Rome, that he may win people to Christ. My friends, the Bible says, He who is wise wins souls. He who is, he who is wise in the sight of God is someone who goes and he wins souls to the Lord Jesus Christ. And my friends, I want to be wise in the sight of God. I want to win people to the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to win people to the gospel message, to faith in the Lord of glory, as Scripture describes Him as. And then the Apostle Paul it explains to us how he does that. In verse 14 and 15, he says, So I am under obligation to, G to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. 
So for my part, I am eager to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome. The gospel message, the good news. But here's the bad news, my friends. Let me, let me explain this to you. I want to explain to you firstly the character of God. Who is God? Because that's, that's one of the most important questions we can ask. Who is our creator and what is he like? Well, my friends, we have no way to know outside of divine revelation. We don't have really a good understanding of God by default because of our sin nature, because we have that inclination to be idol worshipers. So the objective standard to knowing who God is, is going to His Word, His inspired Word. These 66 books all comprise together the Holy Scriptures written by 40 plus authors in three different languages on three different continents over the period of about 1600 years all in perfect agreement and unity. My friends, this is the objective standard of truth. In fact, if you don't stand upon the authority of God's Word, you, you don't have truth. You cannot in your world you have truth. In fact, it's interesting, I often, oftentimes discuss things with atheists, and I love to have discussions with atheists. They're, a lot of them are very friendly folks. And one of the things I simply press them on is there's no, in an atheistic worldview, there's the non-existence of absolute truth. You cannot have absolute truth in an atheistic worldview. In fact, uh, I would go so far as to say I'm an a-atheist. In other words, I don't believe there's a such thing as an atheist. Because an atheist believes that there's just no God. They say, well, I don't, I don't believe that there's a God. My friends, Scripture says, in, in fact, in the same chapter in Romans 1, they know. It doesn't say they even believe. It says they know that there is a God. And they know who He is. They know His character. Because it is revealed in creation. There is a sense outside of divine revelation specifics to the Scripture that God has revealed Himself in nature. The trees, the birds, the animals, even the human body, the complexity. They all testify to the to sovereign controlling power that God has. The, the creative wisdom that God possesses. You cannot have a, a painting without a painter. A building without a builder. A car without a manufacturer, and you certainly cannot have a creation without a creator. It is the most basic form of common sense, but it's rejected. It's not because atheists lack common sense. It's not that. In fact, some of the most smartest people in the world are atheists. It's because they have sin, and they have to, they have to somehow deal with the guilt of sin. And so what they do is they just throw it all off the side. Instead of dealing with their sin before God and repenting, they just throw it off and just say, well, I don't believe in any of it. But that never truly gets to the issue. That never resolves the problem of their sin. It never berids them of the guilt that plagues them. And my friends, only the Gospel can do that. Only the good news of Jesus Christ can, can berid you of this guilt that you have, this burden of iniquity that you carry. And ultimately, that will earn you eternal hellfire. Only the gospel message of Jesus Christ can save you from that. And so as I was saying, God in His Word, in His specific revelation, has, ex has expounded upon His own character. He has explained who He is. He said that He is holy, He hates sin, He is righteous, He is just. In fact, uh, Deuteronomy 4.24 says, The Lord is a consuming fire, a jealous God. Jealous for what? His own holiness, His own vindication. He's jealous for justice. My friends, how many of us become enraged when we hear about someone killing someone else, perhaps even here in, in Greenville County, and we just cannot wait to read in the news about them being punished for murder, them being punished for their law-breaking, because we are jealous for justice. We are created in the image of God, my friends. This, even this moral capacity you have, is a gift from God to show you that God, if we are imperfect and yet we have a sense of justice, how much more God, who is so holy, infinitely righteous, has a sense of justice? Indeed, in, in Exodus 34, it says that He will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. But I also don't want to take away from the aspect that God is gracious and compassionate, that He is the very personification of what love is. He defines it. I do want to tell you that, my friends, because even your being here testifies to the grace of God and the mercy of God upon your life. Even if you don't confess to believe in God, or you confess to believe upon Christ, even just your being here shows God's mercy upon you. And so I never want to belittle that about God, but there's so little preaching, especially, and breaks my heart to say this, within what a lot of what they would call themselves evangelical churches, Supposed to be biblical churches, but you never hear 
the S-I-N spoken of anymore. You don't hear about sin. You don't hear about wrath. You don't hear about hell being preached. You don't hear about judgment. But my friends, it's real. It's real. See, God has put forth His law. God has put forth His holy commandments for us to obey. But here's the issue. Is the law cannot save. And here's the issue. What the law does is show us our sin. That's what the law's purpose is for. My friends, God's commandments were never the means to be saved. People a lot of times will say, well, I'm just trying my best to be saved. I'm just trying to be a good person and I'm going to make it to heaven. My friends, that's not what God's commandments are for. They're to show, show you that you can't earn it. To, they're to show you that you can't be good enough. Even in contradiction to what Jehovah's Witnesses tell you. They're to show you that you are condemned, that you cannot keep the law. See, my friends, just take one of the most simple commands God gave. You shall not lie. You shall not bear false witness. Oh, how many, how many times have we ourselves done that, even in the most smallest ways? In fact, we oftentimes will justify our sin by saying, well, it was a fib, or it was just a quick little story I told. See, my friends, we, we try to self-justify. My friends, we've committed this, and Scripture says in the, in the book of Revelation, all liars will have their place in the lake of fire. Let's look at another commandment. God said, you shall not commit adultery. Well, many people will be quick to say, well, of course, I've never committed adultery, never cheated on my spouse, dear friends. But you have forgotten to take into account that God sees the mind and God sees the heart. For Jesus Christ himself said in, in Matthew chapter uh, 5, he said, if you look at someone else with lust, that is this sexual desire, then you commit adultery in the heart. My friends, God sees your mind. He sees your heart. And many people say, yeah, so he'll know my intentions are right. Let's see what Scripture has to say about that. Let's see if God sees your intentions as being right. In Genesis chapter 6, verse 5, it says, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of men was great on the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. My friends, people are not inherently good. We are inherently broken to the core, dead in sin. We are, in fact, as Romans 1 says at the end of Romans 1, it says that we are haters of God. In fact, listen to this railing judgment the Apostle Paul places upon mankind at the end of Romans 1. He says in verse 28, And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to a depraved mind to do the things which are not proper, being filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice. They are gossip, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful, and although they know the ordinance of God that those who practice such things are worthy of death, they not only do the same, but give hearty approval to those who practice them. Oh, my friends, we are, we are in and of ourselves evil and wicked. I myself as well. In fact, I'm the chief of sinners. And so therefore, because of our guilt before the Creator, because of this law breaking, I mean, I could go through all the commandments. It would probably take me a couple of hours just to dig into the depth of the holiness of God as it's revealed in His law and the sinfulness of man in light of that law. But my friends, suffice it to say, we have broken this law. We're guilty. And so what is God's punishment for sin? That's the question. You know, my friends across the way here, the Jehovah's Witnesses, they'll tell you that well, really, they believe what's called annihilationism. Basically, is there is no hell. You just, you just cease to exist. It just is over. That's what's for the enemies of God. It's just, when you die, you're going to stop existing. But my friends, Scripture paints a different picture. I'll call to my attention, or to your attention, I should say, a text out of Matthew. In Matthew 25, 46, the Lord Jesus said these words about ungodly sinners. This is what He said. He said, these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. My friends, I must, be, I must be true to God's testimony and to God's word, to the full counsel of God, that hell is a real place and that the ungodly are just waiting that death sentence to be crushed in hell. Jesus described hell as a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. That doesn't sound like the end of existence to me. He described it as a place of outer darkness. He described it as a place that the fire is never quenched. My friends, hell is real. I don't want you to go there. I love you and care for your souls. I certainly would not stand out in South Carolina July weather 
If I did not love you and care for your souls and care for where you're going to go when you die, oh my friends, your soul is precious for once it is lost, it cannot be regained. Don't lose your soul for your sins. What will it profit a man if he gains all the riches of this life and all of the great power that there is in this world and he gains all the praise of men but he loses his soul? It will not gain him a thing, my friends. Don't lose your souls for your sins. Instead, be reconciled to God through the Lord Jesus Christ. My God is abundant in the loving kindness, but it's only exclusively found in Christ. So there's this hopelessness we have. No good works can do it. No good works can justify you, my friends. You cannot. You know, some people will say, well, yeah, it's your faith plus your works. You, you got to have faith, but you also got to do this. You got to perform your way. But my friends, Christ's work is sufficient. His work is sufficient. The Scripture says that at the fullness of the times in Galatians 4, 4, that God sent forth His Son, born under the law, born of a virgin, and He lived a perfect life. He fulfilled the commandments as He Himself said in Matthew 5, 17, that He did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. And then He went to the cross and He took upon Himself the judgment of God against sin. Christ was slain under God's wrath. Isaiah 53.10 says, But it pleased the Lord to crush Him. See, my friends, I'll give you to the, this to you by way of an analogy. If you went and you, let's say, let's just go to the extreme, and you said you murdered somebody. Let's say you have to stand before a judge, and you are condemned as having murdered that person, so you're going to have to be killed. You're going to be executed. So you're just sitting on death row waiting as the days go by, and you're just counting down to the death sentence. But my dear friends, God bless you folks, thank you. My dear friends, but if someone comes into that courtroom and they instead say, Judge, I'm going to sit on the bench in place of this guilty murderer. And they take your place. You can leave. Or to put it more legally, this is something that would actually happen in real life, is someone could come into the courtroom and pay your bail. And usually if someone murders someone else, the bail is set to about two to three million dollars. I read about a lady just the other day, or a few weeks ago, she was arrested in California for killing her boyfriend and she, her bail was set at three point five million dollars. It's pretty high. But if someone comes in and they pay your bail, you can leave the courtroom. And this is precisely what the gospel is. God, the Son, God the Lord Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity, pays the bail. He pays the fine for the sins of God's people. He is slain under the wrath of God. On that cross... 2,000 years ago, the center point of history, the, the summit of everything, the reason for all things, the glory of Jesus Christ. And then He rose from the grave. Glory to God. My friends, He rose from the grave. Bodily on the third day, He was exalted after that into heaven. And that is where He is seated now in heaven. On His throne at the right hand of the throne of majesty on high. And Scripture says He is the King of glory. He reigns there and He lives to make intercession for those who draw near to God through Him. Well, so you may ask, well then, what do I do to be saved? The question may arise within your heart, what must I do to be saved? As, as the Philippian jailer asked Paul and Silas in Acts 16, what must I do to be saved? And you know what they said back in, in 1631? This is what they said. They said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. My friends, no amount of performance or religiosity or good works can amend your horrible standing before God. You must simply come to the end of yourself. Forget about yourself. Stop trusting in your religion. Stop trusting in yourself. Stop trusting in your Bible reading and your prayers. And fall upon Christ. Flee your pornography. Flee your lust. Flee your drunkenness. Flee your idolatry. Flee your worship of this world, of, your, of cars, of sports. Flee those things and fall upon the Lord Jesus Christ and trust in Him alone. Trust in His atoning power, His saving power. Think about it. He is the Creator of all things. Think about, think about that. The One who spoke everything into existence. The Almighty God of glory. He can save you from your sins, my friends. He is, a, he is able to save those who draw near to God through Him. 
In fact, he lived for that very purpose, my friends. He's seated there in, in heaven for that purpose. So, here is the biblical command in light of the gospel. It is not try to do better. Have faith and have works. It is simply repent and believe the gospel. Turn from self-trust, self, uh, uh, self-confidence. In fact, Jesus put it this way in, in Luke uh, 9. He said in verse 23, If anyone is to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and come after me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake, he is the one who will save it. For what is a man profited if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul. Oh, dear friends, my friends, and I call you that because I care for you. Don't lose your soul for your sin. Instead, deny yourself and believe upon Christ alone. Trust in the saving power of Christ. And the Bible says simply this, God will pardon you your sins. That's in Luke 24. Jesus said that forgiveness of sins comes about when someone believes the gospel. And then the second thing, and this is so glorious, God wraps you in the righteousness of Christ. God credits to your account Having lived the righteous life of Christ, God treats you as if you lived Jesus' life because He treated Jesus as if He lived your life. Do you see the exchange? Do you see how He takes my sin and I get His righteousness? He takes my filth and I get His perfect garment of, of holiness and purity? My friends, this is the gospel message. It is free. It is a free gift of grace. In fact, uh, the, I, I heard this the other day and I thought it was so profound. The word grace, you could turn it into an acronym. God's riches at Christ's expense, my friends. God's riches at Christ's expense. If you want the riches of God upon your life, and I'm not, I'm not talking about health and wealth and prosperity like all those goofy televangelists. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about eternal life. I'm not out here for your money, my friends. In fact, I, even though I'm a pastor of a church, I'm not even out there for people's money. I'm out there for their eternal salvation, that they have eternal riches in Christ. Oh, my friends, how many people have abused the name of the Lord Jesus for money? You know, the Bible says that you cannot serve both God and mammon. You can't serve both God and wealth. If you are coming to Jesus for money, He's not your God, but money is. If you're coming to Jesus for health, then He's not your God, but your health is. If you're coming to Jesus for an easy life, He is not your God, but an easy life is. You have to come to Jesus Christ because He is worthy. He's glorious. He's beautiful. His, His, His glory is absolutely magnificent. In fact, I was just thinking about this morning on my way up here. Because I have to drive like 45 minutes. I live a ways away. I'm a, I live out in the country. But folks, I was thinking about the glory of Christ. The beauty of Jesus Christ. The glory of the gospel. My friends, believe it. Trust in it. Trust upon Christ alone and God will forgive you and credit to your account Christ's perfect righteousness. The gospel message is, is captured very succinctly, very concisely in 2 Corinthians 5.21. It's my favorite verse in the New Testament at least, maybe the whole Bible. It says, He made Him who knew no sin to be sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. So it's exchange. He takes my sin and I get His perfect righteousness. He takes my filth and I get His righteousness. My friends, that is the good news. And now my hands are clean of your blood, my friends. So the, it lies upon you. You're responsible for your soul. Be reconciled to God. Call upon the name of the Lord. For Scripture says, For whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Will be saved. So my friends, come to Jesus. Come to Him before it's too late. Before the sentence of hell comes. For it will be too late then. It will certainly be too late. So that is the gospel that the Apostle Paul preached. This is what he, this is what he was persecuted for. You know, so many people mock. I do this a lot, so I see people all the time mocking. and No one ever says anything really original. It's always just the same five things said over and over. But nonetheless, my friends, um, Paul was persecuted for preaching this because it's offensive. In fact, uh, the Bible describes the gospel as, in the, it uses the Greek word skandalon, which means, that's where we get the word scandalous from. It's a scandal. It's offensive because it comes to you and says, you're a sinner. You're dead in sin and you need salvation. And so those of you who are unconverted, be saved from this perverse generation. Be saved from this wicked, evil generation. And if you are saved, preach the gospel. Live on the gospel. And 
L preach it until you die. Share it with others, my friends. So this is the gospel. This is the gospel which is for all, as the Apostle Paul says in these verses. That he was, he was eager to preach the gospel to those who are in Rome. Oh, my friends, give God glory. Praise be to the Lord of glory. I'll end off with these words from the Apostle Paul at, in the same book of Romans. <clears throat> Listen to what he says in Romans 11, verse 33. He begins, he says, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are His judgments and unfathomable His ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who became His counselor? Or who was first given to Him that it may, might be paid back to Him again? For from Him and to Him and through Him are all things. To Him be the glory forever. Amen. And I say in agreement with the Apostle Paul, to God be the glory. To the Lord Jesus Christ, the true God and eternal life, to Him be glory forever. Amen.